Hello and good afternoon. So thank you guys for joining us for the afternoon session here on the Hacker Track. So coming up next for us is Gareth Hayes in uh, entitled Exploiting Unknown Browsers and Objects. A little bit about Gareth is he works as a researcher at uh, Port Swigger and loves breaking sandboxes and anything to do with JavaScript. He has developed various free online tools such as Hacker, Hackver <laughs> for uh, Shazer, and also created Mentals, uh, Mentals, I hope Mental JS, yes, <laughs> Mental JS, uh, a JavaScript uh, sandbox that provides a safe uh, uh, DOM environment for sandbox code. So please give him a round of applause as he comes to the stage. Hello everybody. Um, welcome to Exploiting Unknown Browsers and Objects Using the Hackability Inspector. So I believe that when you find a cool bug, you should build tools around that bug. And that's what I'm going to show you today. So a little bit about me. Um, I research, I'm a researcher at Portswigger. Um, I think Portswigger is the best web security company in the world to work for. They're awesome. Um, I love hacking JavaScript. Um, and I use this to simply put, I, I, do, I do this on every single presentation I, I present. Um, it's just a means so I can put some crazy looking JavaScript on there. And today is no exception. So here we have uh, a number followed by the in operator and followed by the alert function. So um, edge allows you to use an in operator after a number without a space, which is pretty crazy. And also, um, it also uses the Unicode character 6158 um, as a space character, no other browser does this. Um, so it looks like the whole thing is joined together, which is pretty crazy. Um, I generally tweet about this sort of stuff. Um, so follow me on Twitter if you want to see about, about that. So um, we created a tool called Hackability. And Hackability was a tool to test the capa uh, capabilities of rendering engines. And it has a series of JavaScript and HTML tests. So some of the tests that might include are, uh, is SOP enabled, uh, is same origin policy enabled, is JavaScript supported, is a CSS imports and stuff like that. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's pretty basic because it has to support um, older browser clients. Um, so the basic tests are on the left. So like um, is uh, CSS imports allowed? Are style attributes allowed? Are forms supported, etc.? And on the right, we've got more interesting JavaScript tests. So, is Phantom JS detected, for example? Is SVG supported? Or are we using ES5 or ES6? And the more green you get, the more the better it is for a researcher to hack this particular browser. Um, and it can also detect your local IP address using WebRTC, for example. Um, but the most interesting one for this talk is the JavaScript environment difference. So what this is, is it collects all the known properties on window on every browser and looks for stuff that isn't in there. So this will be interesting objects to inspect. So the hackability tool will, in, it will tell you what objects are there that are interesting. So it finds the interesting stuff but we have no means to inspect these objects. So we know what they are, but we don't know how to inspect them. Uh, we need a new tool, basically. Um, so this is like life before dev tools. It felt like banging rocks against a computer. So this is browser dev tools, basically. Um, so back in the day when I was coding, um, JavaScript and HTML uh, back in, nine, in the 90s, 99, 98 or something. Um, you just had view source. And can you imagine just debugging nowadays with just view source? It would be an absolute nightmare. Um, and no console, you were reduced to doing alert and then the variable. So it was pretty crazy. And you're in the same sort of situation when you're investigating a rendering engine that you don't know what it is and what it does and what um, security is enabled, what what security protections are in place. Um, and so when, when the browser has no dev tools um, and when 
the, the dev tools are missing on this rendering engine. You're in the same sort of situation. So how do you know what objects are available? And how can you find the interesting stuff? So me and James was talking. Um, he was using my tool called uh, Hackverter, which has got an inspector. And he said that we need an inspector for hackability because we know these objects that have been detected, but we have no means to inspect them because we're in a browser that doesn't have dev tools because it, it's just been rendering on a page. And sometimes it's not even allowing you to interact with it. So I said, yeah, we need something like dev tools, but for security. And so the inspector was born. So the inspector is basically like taking a magnifying glass and looking at the objects and inspecting them. So it's your missing tools for uh, security, basically. Um, it will find you and show the most interesting stuff first. So if a developer defines a custom object, um, that maybe a bridge, for example, a Java bridge, then it will show you that sort of stuff first. And it will run security tests on each of the properties as well. So it'll try and exploit these objects. So for example, you might have a cross-domain uh, iframe window object, um, and this tool will allow you to inspect that object and test it for security flaws. Um, so here I've um, put in the window object, I'm an, and I'm inspecting the window object. So on the left is the name, so in this case it's window, the value, the value of the window object, and the property info on the right is where some more interesting stuff is. So it'll tell you um, the type of object, its length, if it's a function, how many arguments it's got, what type of object it is. So in this instance, it's detected it as the window object. And this is really important because the window object is the key to uh, enumerating stuff. And you can send that information to input, so that will copy it to the input box. Um, and here I've enumerated the window, and underneath is the results of the enumeration, and you can click on the arrows and drill down further and um, enumerate further on the different properties. Um, it also supports HTML, um, and it will detect if the character begins with a less than sign and then write it to the DOM so that you can inspect these HTML objects. Um, and as I said, you can uh, inspect normal objects or you can inspect cross-domain window objects. Um, and you can filter it too, so you can regex it by property name. Um, you can filter it by the type of object, which is really interesting for uh, hacking JavaScript because it allows you, allows you to detect um, what, if it's a window object, the browser might add a new property called global, for, for instance. So from a JavaScript hacker's point of view, it's useful to know these objects are windows and the, and the value of the property. And if it's a window object, it will filter by interesting, so it'll show you the interesting stuff first with a, just a simple checkbox. So the key to this are windows. Once you know there's a window, then you can enumerate that object. And if you know it's a cross-domain window, you can perform security tests on it to make sure that SOP is uh, properly enforced. Um, so to detect a window, um, it's pretty simple. So this function basically looks at the window property and compares it against itself. And it will be detected as the window object. And um, if that property doesn't exist, or, or it doesn't equal itself, then it will return false. So that's a cool way of detecting windows, and you can filter by that so you can f get all the window objects. And you can also detect a cross-domain window using the following technique. Um, so here we have a function that it reuses that is window function, and it check this, this, the is window function will work on the cross-domain object, um, but you're just proving that it's a window. To actually prove that it's a cross-domain window, we try and read the location uh, property of the window and then convert that to a string. And that will raise an exception for a cross-domain window. Um, so when the exception is thrown, that will be detected as a cross-domain window um, because those checks have been passed. So it's a pretty cool way of detecting a cross-domain window. Um, so here I've entered the uh, window object again, and I've filtered by window to get all the window objects. 
Um, and this is how to detect the function constructor. So I borrowed this from AngularJS. Um, so it, it looks at the constructor property and compares it against itself. And this will detect the function constructor. So a function constructor is interesting because it allows you to execute arbitrary code. And a function constructor can come from another domain. So detecting these function constructors are highly important when you're testing browsers for security flaws. Um, and I came up with this cool technique of detecting the object constructor. Uh, AngularJS gave up on that, but I came up with this. Um, so you check if the object is truthy, has it got the proto property, and then comparing the proto.proto .proto, uh, property of the object to the constructor, and that will detect the object constructor. So the object constructor is interesting too, um, because it doesn't allow you to execute arbitrary code, but it allows you to modify um, the uh, global um, properties and global objects. Uh, okay, so I'd like to give you a quick demo of the tool, just so we know what we're talking about. So this is the tool. Um, the idea here is you can run this tool on your own website and um, run it from there to inspect um, web services that render pages. So I'll, I'll tr first of all, I'll inspect the window object, if you can see. Um, and you can filter it by type. So I want to get, so you can get Java bridges, for example. Uh, you can get function constructors, DOM nodes. But in this instance, I'll get uh, a window object. And immediately, it will show you all the window objects, which is pretty cool. Um, from a hacking point of view, the, the windows are, are the key, really. Um, so you can also filter by uh, a regex. So I could look for a top, for instance. And that would instantly show me the property. And as I said, you can um, in inspect cross-domain window objects. Uh, so here, I've got an iframe that's pointing to x-domain.com with an ID of x. And then once you've done that, you can then use the reference to the object, which is x, and inspect a cross-domain window object. So immediately now, we get loads of properties on this cross-domain window object. But the interesting one is the content window. So the content window is the window of the iframe. And that's security restricted, so you can only access certain properties. So if we select cross domain window, you can see the, um, the inspector has enumerated that. It, it can't get its value, but it'll still show it. And it will say on the right hand side that this is a cross domain window. And when you click on the inspection and enumerate, you can see it's enumerated further. And you can see all the functions that you can call on that cross domain window object. Um, so because it can detect a cross domain window, it knows that the object is possibly a cross domain object too. So for example, the close, uh, prop, the close function on the content window. Um, so it will try tests um, to overwrite properties on that function, um, which could lead, uh, lead to same origin policy bypasses. Okay. So let's talk about a few bugs, because that's what I like to talk about. Um, so in the past, um, I found a, quite a few cool bugs that I've incorporated into the inspector. Um, and this one is pretty simple. Um, Safari allowed you to overwrite the host property of the location object. So you might think to yourself, well, that's not a really big deal. But what happened was the query string also was sent when you overwrite the host property. So you could have an iframe that pointed to um, a, di a different origin, and then you could change the location host property uh, to a different domain, and then that would send the query string so you could steal data, basically, that you shouldn't be allowed to. Um, also, Safari allowed you to overwrite the top and parent object with another function. Um, so here we have an iframe, 
and it overwrites the parent and top function with the alert function. And then on that external domain, um, I've shown a script here, but it would probably be a click. So you could call parent as a function and call top as a function and that would execute. Um, so it was like a same origin policy bypass because normally that wouldn't be allowed. And this one is a cool bug. Um, I reported privately to Microsoft. Um, basically, the closed property was leaking a cross-domain constructor, um, which sounds quite complicated, but it's pretty simple when I show you the code. Um, so if we've got an iframe and we've got a content window, now interestingly, the closed property applies to uh, window objects, and it tells you quite obviously that if the window is closed or not. But this also applies to an iframe for some reason, and that's probably because it's a window object as well. Um, so what Microsoft did, they forgot about this property, and they weren't doing any checks whatsoever on it, uh, and it was a cross-domain Boolean object. So if you get the, the constructor of the cross-domain Boolean object, you get the Boolean constructor, and then the constructor of that is a function constructor, and the function constructor allows you to execute arbitrary code. So when you, pop, when you uh, execute that alert and pop that alert, it will actually uh, tell you the domain of the um, iframe, the cross-origin iframe. So you've got basically universal XSS. Um, this one is probably my favorite bug. Um, so this was similar to the previous bug that I showed you but with one important difference. So in this way, they were, they were leaking the constructor property of the location object. Um, and you could use prototype, define getter, and dot constructor to get the function constructor. But this time, it was quite interesting. I tried to call the alert function, and it, it didn't work. It said, this is a cross-domain function constructor. You're not allowed to do that. Um, so I thought, hmm, I shouldn't still be allowed to call the function constructor but it's not allowing me to access these functions, what, what else could I do? So I thought, well, let's see what, if it evaluates. So I did one plus one and see if I got two. And it did, it worked. So that got me thinking, maybe if you overwrite um, a, a function on, on an array object, for example, you could get arbitrary code execution in the context of that domain. So what I did was um, I overwrote the join function so I overwrote the join function um, and for every single array on that domain. So when the join function was called on that, that, that domain, it would execute my code and it would, and it would uh, alert pawned with the uh, contents of the body in a HTML. So that's another universal exercise. Um, this one was quite funny. Um, Firefox 15 shipped without any protections whatsoever on the location object. Um, so I created a blog post called um, Firefox Knows What Your Friends Did Last Summer. And basically what it did was open um, the Twitter list page, which redirected you to a personalized uh, list uh, page that contained your Twitter handle. And then Firefox just didn't check the location at all. So then you could get the user ID of the Twitter user, and then get all their friends uh, here. So that was pretty bad. Um, and these bugs would be easily detected in the uh, inspector. Um, so this one was uh, a Safari universal XSS. So um, back in the day, I was testing Safari, um, and I found um, that the about blank context wasn't being enforced correctly for local files. So um, I reported this to Apple, and they refused to say that this was a problem. So you could open a local file with a local HTML file, and it could read Amazon.co.uk, for example, and that was really bad. Um, so I stayed up 23 hours to try and prove that this was a, a serious bug. So as soon as the beast came out, I stayed up 20, uh, 23 hours straight. I can't do that now because uh, I've got kids, but back in the day, that's what I used to do. And um, basically, the exploit just involved using an iframe, uh, use it, pointing it to about blank. Then when that loaded, overwrite the document body dot in a HTML with another iframe. Um, this was before clickjacking, so this worked. Um, you, could, you could iframe any website. 
Um, and basically, it would load amazon.co.uk, and then you had access to the inner HTML or the cookies. So all these bugs will be easy to find with the inspector, and I've incorporated some of these into it as well. Um, I've created some automated tests that find all this sort of stuff. Um, and some of the stuff like the Opera bug that I showed um, requires manual analysis because sometimes if you call the, the function constructor, um, it won't always return the value that, it, that, you, that you have access to. So you might need to use a tool for manual analysis um, and try and exploit the bugs um, because things like overwriting um, the join function, for example, are difficult to do uh, automated. Um, so here's a couple of security tests that I've got. Um, so once you know you've got a cross domain window, um, you can try and set a property on that cross domain window object. So here we just overwrite the property test and read it back. And then you can set, it will display a, a message saying that you can set properties on a cross domain window. So this can lead to same origin policy bypasses because if, for example, um, the website is framed and then you can call the function like blur, for example, and then you call the, the you use the cl uh, call property on the blur function, then if you can overwrite that, then that can lead to universal access. Um, and this one is pretty cool. Um, this is a, a test based on a Safari bug. So it checks for data leaking in exceptions. So if you've got um, a cross-domain window object, so in this case, OBJ is the cross-domain window object, and you try to read a property on that object, Safari throws an exception, but actually um, it leaks the origin in the exception. So you can discover what iframes are on a, a different domain, um, and you can get the origin on Safari. Um, so this will extract the, the origin and show you that it's vulnerable. Um, so how can you know if you've got a cross-domain function, a cross-domain function constructor? So there's no inbuilt way of doing this. So there's no like, is this a cross-domain function constructor property? Um, what you have to do is return the document.domain to discover it. So what you do, you call the function constructor. So this object could be any object. It could be a Boolean, like I showed you before. It could be a function. Um, so th in this case, it's an object literal. So the constructor of the object literal is the object constructor. And then the constructor of that is the function constructor. And then when we return document.domain, that will return x-domain.com. So that would um, indicate that this is a cross-domain function constructor. Um, so I've incorporated this into the tool. So as you enumerate cross-domain window objects, it will try and determine if you've got a cross-domain function constructor. So this tool can even earn you bug bounties. And I recommend running it on mobile applica uh, applications like um, a, a mobile browser. Um, because it can find you universal XSS. So I use that technique to check the domain against the current domain that you're on. So um, the function constructor is called, it returns the document.domain, and you compare it against the document.domain of the current window, and that will tell you if you've got a cross-domain function constructor. Um, and it also, the Opera bug that I showed you, um, I've also incorporated that check into, into it as well. So it will check using the different method to see if you've got a cross-domain function constructor. Um, but in the Opera case, you will probably have to do manual analysis to determine if it's vulnerable or not. Um, so next thing I want to talk about are Java bridges. So a Java bridge is a means for JavaScript and Java to communicate. So you can call JavaScript functions from Java, and you can call Java functions from JavaScript. And Java bridges are interesting because they are uh, defined by the developer and could contain remote code execution. And 
I was using um, JX browser, which is um, a Java library that en enables you to use Chromium in Java. Um, and I, I was using a bridge, and I thought, this looks dodgy, really dodgy. Um, so I, I was trying to exploit it, um, and I was trying to create a new socket. Um, and I could create a new socket, and I, I knew this was interesting. Um, but I couldn't find a way to exploit it. So I asked Patrick and, uh, uh, Patrick and Mike uh, to come over, um, and we, we all worked on it together to try and exploit it. Um, so the first thing the inspector does when you select the Java bridge filter is detect if it is a Java bridge. If it is a Java bridge, it tries to create a new socket. This emulates my manual test, how I found the vulnerability. So if you can create a new socket, then um, it indicates that this is probably an exploitable Java bridge. And I've tried to do it in a generic way using this test, so it'll work on other Java bridges too. And then once we know that this um, bridge can, you can create new sockets, then I can, use an, I can generate an exploit using get class. So first step is to detect if it's a Java bridge. So this is the function I came up with. It's pretty simple. It just looks for get class and hash code and detects it. If, it, if it's got those properties, then it will be detected as a Java bridge. And then we need to check if, it, if it's vulnerable. Um, so get class allows you to get a Java class. So in this instance, we're using uh, java.net socket and creating a new instance. Now, I knew this was exploitable. Um, because you shouldn't be allowed to create socket objects. But I couldn't exploit it um, because the bridge that I was using wouldn't allow me to call functions on that um, object when it was created. So I had to come up with a different method. Um, and so this is how to uh, exploit the bridge using get class. Uh, you get the field. Um, so the current runtime is a private field. So we get the current runtime of the runtime object. Then we make that public. So we change it from private to public. And then we've got access to the runtime object. And then we can call field.get, and we can get the runtime, and then pop the calculator. Um, so I exploited JX browser with this technique. Um, and team dev, the guys who make it, um, patched this bug with annotations. Um, they did it in a way that was puzzling, uh, but probably because of legacy code. Um, they made it off by default, so if you don't have any annotations, then um, it would allow you to call any function on the Java any uh, function on the Java bridge. Um, so the idea of the JS annotation is you mark which functions you want to be accessible to JavaScript. So uh, if you don't have any at all, then it's vulnerable by default. Um, but I used the inspector, and I inspected the Java bridge, and guess what? I exploited it again. Um, and the reason was, even though you've got annotations, so if you put an annotation on a function, um, you should only be able to call that function. But the references to other objects weren't being checked as well. So you could get a field on another object and then get, use get class and you've got remote code execution again. So here we've got a bridge, we get a test object, we get the field and then we can call get class and we've got remote code execution again. And so the bridge was broken again. So I'd like to give you a quick demo. Oh, I'm gonna give you a demo of breaking the bridge and also the Safari uh, exception issue. Um, which is quite interesting. So the first demo I want to give you is the uh, Java bridge. Oops. So here we've got some uh, Java code that loads the inspector. So it loads the inspector, and we've got a bridge, and the bridge has uh, a completed function and a super secret function. Um, okay, so I'll run that. Pray to the demo gods. Whew, thank God for that. 
Right, so now I can use the inspector and I don't have any dev tools, so I can inspect the window object. And what the inspector does straight away is it highlights the interesting stuff. So immediately it's found the bridge um, automatically and it's tried to exploit the bridge. So it's, it's detected here, it thinks it's a Java bridge and then it, it thinks it's an exploitable Java bridge. And to prove it's exploitable, it generates a proof of concept depending on what OS you are on and that should point, uh, pop the calculator. And you can inspect it further. So um, the Java bridges um, have Java methods like get methods. So you can inspect the Java bridge and it will enumerate it for you. So you can see it's got the completed function. It's got the super secret function somewhere. Uh, yeah, so you can enumerate the bridge, find these interesting functions and exploit them further. So now I wanna show you the Safari bug. Uh, so hopefully you can see that a lot better. Um, first of all, I'm gonna load an iframe. So if you can't see, it, it loads an iframe to x-domain.com um, with an ID of x. So that iframe's from another domain. So now if we inspect the x object, you can see it's found that the cross-domain window is leaking the origin from the exception and it shows you the, um, the domain on the right-hand side. So in this case, Safari is doing something wrong. No other browser does this. No other browser leaks the uh, exception, um, the origin in the exception. Um, to see what the inspector saw, we can just convert the uh, window object to a string, and you can see the exception for yourself. Uh, and the, the origin is being leaked on Safari. So um, the origin's being leaked, but not the query string or anything like that. So it's uh, not a super serious bug, um, but a bug nevertheless. Um, so it's got some advanced inspection features. Um, so as I said, you can use um, Oh, in, sorry, in this instance, you, you can execute JavaScript on every property. So here, um, I'm inspecting the window object. I'm giving it a regex of one to three characters. And the JavaScript that's being executed is alert with the property, and it's filtering by functions. Um, so inside the JS filter, OBJ uh, refers to the current object, and prop re refers to the current property. So for instance, if you wanted to call a function on every property of that object, oops, ah, sorry, um, then you would use obj prop and then uh, parenthesis to call every function on that object. Um, so yeah, query, query string parameters are supported for every inspection feature. And this is super important. Um, this is a blind parameter. Now this is pretty cool because it will save the inspection results. So you might encounter a website that allows you to render a page, but doesn't allow you to interact with it. If you pass the blind parameter to the tool, then it will enumerate the object and then save the results so you can view later. And you can view the results from display.php on the tool. Um, so use cases for the tool is you can find um, browser issues. And I, I, I do a lot of fuzzing in JavaScript. And I use the multi-line mode in the tool to um, fuzz JavaScript, and I found a lot of bugs doing that. Um, I think sandboxes are gonna be um, quite important in future. So when you're in a sandboxed environment, you can use the tool to inspect that environment to see if you can break out of the sandbox. So it's useful for that. And you need to use a blind mode when you can't interact with the browser um, because it's a lot easier to enumerate the objects. Um, so a couple of shortcuts. So up, down, cycles through history, and alt plus alt works in multi-line mode. Um, multi-line mode is initiated um, when blocks are entered, such, it, such as if blocks or while loops, for example. Um, if you hit return, it will evaluate and inspect. And if you hit control and return, it will just execute. Um, and shift and return will evaluate and return the output. 
such as one plus one, and it'll tell you the value. Um, if you hit control backspace, that will clear the results and shift, control shift backspace will clear your history. Um, so to conclude, um, don't stop testing because you don't have um, any dev tools um, and use the inspector to gather information about your environment. Um, and you can exploit that environment using interesting functions. So like I used get class in the Java bridge, um, you can get remote code execution if you look hard enough. And so this is life before the inspector. It was a lot like banging stones against your computer trying to get it to do what you wanted. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, my question is, um, this tool could be useful for um, testing server-side request forgery All right. bugs with the blind mode, yes? I mean, it makes sense to use something like, to, for, for something like this. I mean, not, not this like browser bugs, but I mean, if you have some kind of rendering engine which you don't know how yeah, it works and well, stuff. Yeah, if it's blind and you don't, yeah, maybe, yeah, you could use it for that, um, yeah. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thanks. Ha have you uh, thought or tried something with JavaScript inside the PDF? Uh, ja it, the JavaScript that you can execute in a yeah, PDF? Yeah, I've done, I've done some testing on PDFs, and I've enumerated um, properties in PDFs, and there seems to be a lot of like crashes and some bugs in Acrobat. Um, so I've, I've used the same techniques I've shown today um, to enumerate objects in PDFs. and. It does look like there's some um, decent bugs to be found in there still, even now. Yeah. Thank you. Out of curiosity, what is the special use case of is Phantom JS? Um, well, because, for example, you can cause denial of service. So if this Phantom JS is being used, you can open a new window using like uh, a really ancient function like show model dialog, I think, and that can cause denial of service on the server um, because basically the window pops up and it doesn't close, so that can, it can lock the server basically. So yeah, that, that's just some of the stuff that I found, but there could be other, other issues as well, so it's important to know. Um, and also it's an, it's an outdated uh, rendering engine too, so that's super important to know as well. Any more questions? I guess not, so thank you. Thank you, Gareth.